Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Sabi Ahmed, I'm the Associate Director and Curator of the HR Art Foundation. I'm delighted to welcome you to the last and final stage, the sixth stage of the transformation of our ongoing exhibition, Growing Like a Tree, Static in the Air. The exhibition is curated by Sohra Pura, uh, who actually curated the first iteration of this exhibition that opened in January 2021. It ran until the 1st of August. And on the 11th of September, five days ago, we opened the first iteration, or the second iteration. The first iteration titled Growing Like a Tree brought together a network of practitioners from South Asia and beyond. And this is a, this is a network that was demonstrated in the exhibition along with a map of interconnectedness that talked about how practices across geographies, across media, seem to speak to each other and also collaborate and, and support one another and how this network, as fragile as it may be, is in fact a very resilient network. And that message seems to be quite a resounding one in a moment such as this, where we've all seen all kinds of distances being imposed, all kinds of lockdowns being imposed, all kinds of uh, safety measures being taken that actually create more distances and they create proximity. And this exhibition in a way suggested different ways proximities can be produced, shared, and it's been an inspiring process, at least for all of us at Ashara, who work closely with Sohrab and a group of artists who come together in the first iteration into the second. Uh, what we're going to do this, uh, this evening is to, do a first, to first do a virtual tour of the exhibition, uh, followed by a conversation. And today's conversation actually brings together the largest gathering of voices of all the transformations we've had so far. And we bring together the, uh, two collectives, the first Nepal Picture Library that was part of the first iteration and lingers on into the second iteration. And the second, the packet collective that has faded in or rather actually quite loudly screeched into the exhibition. And we're going to look at their work. But before we go into the tour and the conversation with everyone, I want to quickly just uh, give a shout out and thank especially all the people that made possible this exhibition. It won't be possible to name everyone, but at least from the Ishara team, I wanted to uh, call out some names and, and especially highlight them because they've kind of not been the ones on the, in the foreground. My former colleague who was here last year and has now gone back to her hometown in the US, Laura Metzler, who was the operations, production and programs manager at the Ishara Foundation, who really helped shape the exhibition in the first iteration. My colleagues Santosh and Neha. Neha, I'm going to take the camera from you and I'm going to point the camera to you. This is Neha, who's the programs and uh, communications coordinator at the foundation. She's been the one with the camera every day when we start the tour. Thank you, Neha. My colleague Santosh, who's looked after all the maintenance, safety, and also a lot of the install of the exhibition. Santosh, thank you very much. My colleague Himanshu Kadam is with us already on Zoom. So a big thank you to you, although you're going to be part of the conversation, so I won't show you yet. Um, there have been many others, installers, framers, technicians, friends of ours who have helped to remotely so problem solve all kinds of technical uh, difficulties with regard to say how this dot matrix printer by, by the packet is supposed to uh, run the way we want it to, or how to modulate sound and projector lights, etc. So on that note, let me quickly begin the tour as we do every day. What I'm going to do is to point out the transformations and emphasize on those rather than give an exhibition tour. And these transformations will cave into really um, what our conversation today is going to be about, which is going to be about vows. And the topic is quite dear to me because it starts, it takes at the starting point, the archive and accumulation of material, information, knowledge, experiences, but also does it, should it just stay as an accumulation or does it flow out into other ways, into other means, and how does it flow out? So we're going to talk a lot about those flows and different ways accumulations can be imagined rather than just sitting still and cluster together. So while cluster was an important um, kind of methodology that this exhibition deployed, 
and you will see plenty of that in this exhibition. Another way we wanted to bring this exhibition to life was to think of these clusters as moving entities, not fixed. This is something that I hope Sohrab will speak about a little later when we talk about this exhibition and uh, the ideas that uh, opened up in this. So as part of the most recent transformation, uh, we had this table that got reoriented, which previously had photographs by the Anjali House, uh, a group of children who's uh, based in uh, Cambodia. And that got replaced by uh, works by Kushal Ray, which talk about an intimate relationship of staying with the family when family members are soon departing. And what does it mean to stay with them, to stay with loss, and for them to continue staying with us even while they're not around? The table moving in created a different kind of a corner and flow within the exhibition, too. So whereas this table was pushed a little forward and a little sideways, it would kind of become a passage. Now it just has people going all around and curving in sometimes rather than really taking these two as passages and then coming to this. We've had all kinds of notations removed also. And in place, other notations come in. A few days ago, a notation by Jason Nageswaran that was previously around this area, amplified and grew into a large river state in the exhibition. This is perhaps the largest photograph in the show, but at the same time, it is only a notation. And as a notation, it formed a cluster with other notations. I would like to show you Jaisin's map. In the previous iteration, Sohrab had sent in a map of interconnectedness he drew that practically served as a concept note for the exhibition. Subsequently, my colleagues and I approached all the artists that were participating to send in their maps of interconnectedness, maps that would kind of show or bring to light the different, uh, the rhizomic relationships that all of these artists uh, participate and share within the exhibition and beyond. It invokes all kinds of places and geographies and events that, that bring people or congregate people, different kinds of collectives that, that they are inspired by or work closely with. Jessing's map is the one that entered the exhibition, although we are planning that everyone else's maps uh, will be accessible on the website platform, Vishara. So here you can, if you see closely, you'll find events, you'll find dates, you'll find people all clustered together in the way um, uh, Jessing uh, draws his map. And if I may, I'll quickly read out how this map is introduced. As I work on this map, I'm reminded of our house being demolished in the year 1999 by some upper caste people. The same group of people that demolished our school had a hand in this. In a village, uh, uh, in a village hearing that followed, I heard the villagers saying, Bonutai and her family have grown like a free, stronger and mightier than the upper caste. And this free should be cut, this tree, sorry, uh, have grown like a tree, stronger and mightier than the upper caste. And this tree should be cut down every single time it, stri it strives to grow stronger. As I draw a parallel with the tree that I am part of now, I feel like a bird building my nest in this tree. This tree has grown strong and spread wide, nurturing growth, bearing witness to my tumultuous memories that have taken shape as photographic images. As I rest, one of the branches looking at the world ahead, my images chirp and clear. This is by Jessing. He wrote this note in 2021. It shows an interconnectedness that is fraught, an interconnectedness that is not always about tenderness, but about resistance, about growing stronger, about resisting all kinds of oppression. This photograph, which is a notation by Jessing and Nanmada, refers to history with displacement, refers to experiences that are still lived around displaced people, displaced lives, because of either state intervention or social kinds of oppression that continue to live and, and, and strive even against so many people. 
um, and goodwill. Next to it is Zainab. Zainab in the first confirmation virtual tour that we had, talked about her experiences growing up in Kashmir, staying in a home where going to bed at night, and waking up every morning, was loomed by this worry or fear or concern and dread all changing day by day about whether their own home might get bombed. And these, this, this trust of image somewhere refers to that kind of looming, danger looming. Looming disappearing. And yet a kind of resilience. This work previously was, was positioned um, around this, sorry, I meant this work here. is a work by Jessin that was previously positioned in place of Zainab's. Now, Jessin's work, I Feel Like a Fish, or this, this is a part of that, has become a notation to Zainab's, just like another notation by, by Jessin there. So you can see all of these resonances where it's not so much about family, even though one might be talking about their mother, one might be talking about their grandmother, Sean would be talking about his parents, or Kushal might be talking about uh, staying in a home. It is also so many other layers, so many other dimensions of these works and the meaning that start to become more prominent based on the new configurations that form in this exhibition. So until Jessing's map over there had not entered, this work suggested a slightly different reading based on its relationship with works next. With Jessing's work coming in, the, the, the power of the story with regard to displacement, homes getting, getting demolished, uh, homes getting destroyed, um, seems to get highlighted even more strongly. Yeah. On the other end is the work by Packet. This work is titled the heavy weight of tiny little things. It's an Epson dot matrix printer sputtering out images that they send. Every day, this mound accumulates. We still have to see people coming and picking up some of these printouts. But you'll also notice that behind this was a large cluster of photographs and documents by the Nepal Picture Library. And that has faded out this time, leaving behind only a red thread. This red thread, along with some of the storylines, continues to linger on. The storylines of two protagonists, Sushila Shrestha and Shanta Manavi, whose archival collections were brought together in this project, that tell about the public life of some very strong women and collectives resisting against, again, government oppression, social tyranny. This line continues, it drops. It becomes a graphite line that follows into the work of Dungana, who, in fact, is associated with Nepal, uh, with Nepal Picture Library, but also works as an independent artist. The red thread becomes red pigment, becomes red light, along the work by Sadar Pratik. Another rather substantial transformation that has taken place, even though someone who's just passing by may not notice, is the film by Manim Wasif, his title Khayal has now been replaced by film by Prantik Basu, like a Saki Sona. There's a lot of resonance between the previous film and these, almost as if the ghost of one continues to haunt this one, because it is about spaces of fiction, spaces you go back to again and again and again, and really question whether it's even possible to go back to a place because that place is not the same and even you're not. In a similar vein, this exhibition is not the same. And today morning, someone had visited, someone who'd seen quite closely the, the first iteration and went through it and asked me quite innocently, so what all changed? And 
this was with an awareness that the law has changed, but trying to map this change was seeming difficult at this friend. And I had to think for a moment how to describe this change. And what I said finally was that actually everything's changed, and yet everything looks rather similar. It's hard to tell what's changed, what specifically is changing, because everything has changed, and yet so much of the structural elements remain similar. And so talking about clusters, talking about intimacies, talking about accumulations, the exhibition really somewhere draws attention to new configurations of clusters along with other clusters to form something else. And at the same time, drawing reference to the title Static in the Air, looking at how things that may seem similar, things that may just seem atmospheric, are in fact changing all around us, quite like the way we think about radio stations changing. It's the same airwaves, or are they? So this brings us to a conclusion of the virtual tour of the final stage. This is the stage that will continue to stay until the 9th of December. And the Sorab comes and changes his mind. At least so far, this is what we have. For those who might pass by the by, we hope you'll get a chance to see it in person. Otherwise, we will be organizing more tours, virtual and physical. And finding other modes of activation of this exhibition can be accessed virtually. On that note, let me pass it over to Sorab. Sorab, maybe you can say a little bit about the exhibition. Thank you, Sabi, for um, the past six days for uh, taking us through, taking me through this exhibition as well, along with everyone else. Because um, I think um, um, after the last iteration, I'd made a video for uh, Dayanita where um, every time I have an exhibition, she would always ask me to uh, make a video and send it to her. And uh, she would always complain that it wasn't. Uh, you know, doing justice to uh, the exhibition. And, and I think through that, um, I learned that uh, there is this element of addressal that also comes into the walkthroughs which you've been bringing in so beautifully in the last, you know, um, six days. And thank you so much for that. Uh, thank you also for, um, to the packet and to NPL for being present here for the last uh, conversation. Hopefully, only for this time and we can continue later as well. Um, when when uh, Sabi had written to me about the exhibition, um, what I think had, um, um, you, you know, what, what, what I was quite bothered by at that moment was that I always felt that an institution always fixed uh, the work into, um, into something. And, and um, Somehow, as someone making work myself, I was aware that an image, for example, or a work is uh, when we are making it is actually extremely open. And I think actually image is one of the most open vessels of information where you can keep coming back to it and you can keep drawing out different meanings. And um, when we install Growing Like a Tree, um, we actually wanted to um, think in terms of not only echolocations, but clusters, because we wanted to have a feeling of uh, disruption. Uh, you know, we never wanted um, someone, we never wanted the exhibition to turn thematic. Uh, we wanted, you know, the methodology of exhibition making to be present. We wanted uh, there to be something structural. And we also wanted um, people to kind of, um, also be able to touch what um, lay outside the work. And I think when you look at a cluster, when you look at, for example, um, you know, uh, the cluster that uh, Sabi took you to, uh, I've seen a change um, uh, in a way Sabi and I have worked on this change, but we've also in a way, as Sabi beautifully put it uh, yesterday, um, it hasn't been really, transference of um, one iteration to the other. It's been 
all of us, uh, all the artists and us kind of crossing this bridge together, you know, and in the crossing of that bridge, uh, I think um, there's been uh, at, at some moments uh, you've had um, Zenab and Sean walk together, which brought something to um, the landscape at that moment. Uh, in today's iteration, you have um, uh, Jessing, Farah, Zainab, and a part of Sean, and some remnants of uh, Satish um, walking together. And um, it's only it's only today, last night, actually, I discovered that uh, even though I had um, planned on putting Jessing's map next to his notation, what I realized only this morning was that. Um, he starts off with a line talking about um, his, you know, in 1999, his house being demolished. And, and um, on the first day when Zenab talked uh, about six days ago, um, what was quite important for her to express was that um, she's, she back home in Kashmir is working on two different planes. One is that she's making work for herself as you know, the work at home where there's a focus on the garden, which is not just about the familiar, as Sabi had pointed out, but also about the space of the garden at a time when there's a lockdown. Um, are you like, she's looking at um, um, these crossing overs from her room into the garden, from the garden walls outside where she, can, where she can't go to. Um, but what ended up happening was that she, she, she wanted to show us um, because it was important for her to anchor the work in a certain context. She talked about um, also working as a press photographer back home. Uh, and just recently, she had been asked to go and photograph um, uh, a house that got destroyed um, during an encounter. And um, she had photographed, she was talking about how the kitchen became uh, the first place, you know, uh, which had been destroyed by the army in a, in a site of occupation. And um, she was talking about how privileged she felt that um, when she was looking at the work that she was doing, that she has a home, but at the same time, along with that, there was always this undercurrent of waiting for the same destruction to happen. And somehow, um, I never kind of you know, it was only today after we installed uh, Jessing's map, which begins with that memory of 1999 of a house being destroyed. Um, somehow this entire cluster, again, gets a different layer of fragility. And, and what I'm trying to say is that uh, as someone making work, that's been not just my struggle, but I feel when I talk to many people, there's been a struggle to uh, want to choose their own context, but yet, you know, somehow um, their works always get um, uh, cloaked over by some other kind of context and it eventually ends up getting a fixed meaning. And I think this is a, strug this is a fight that's constant and which is something that Zena was talking about, which is something that um, in, a, in larger conversations, Jessing has talked about in terms of him looking at the self after having gone and photographed the other and um, so yeah I mean in the what I'm hoping with this exhibition is that um, in this slowness of transformation you know I'm imagining it to be in almost like a slow motion uh, change uh, where we get to see you know each and every element which is slipping in slipping out and in that process we also getting the time to kind of um, really, really kind of uh, look at it as uh, a staggered shift instead of um, a more immediate shift uh, in the two exhibition uh, exhibitions that are here at Dishara. And, um, and yeah, I mean, I mean, for me, it's all about unfixing the works. And uh, I think I think as someone making work, I feel that that's also my responsibility to at times unfix it and times to fix it and um, over the last few days we've been talking about peaks we've been talking about um, uh, slowness uh, we've been talking about all these other 
sort of, I would say, tools um, which actually have gone into the making of the exhibition to kind of push and pull um, anyone who's visiting um, to kind of um, to look and then look again and then to look again, you know. So hopefully what I'm, I'm hoping that um, um, the second iteration is the start of a momentum. Uh, whether we have a third iteration, fourth iteration, I don't know, but I hope that someone who's visited both the iterations can now maybe imagine the third to begin with. So I'm going to give it back to Sabi to, uh, you know, just start off the discussions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah. No, that was, it was very valuable to hear that. And I think the unfixing of things is, is uh, an important message to, to keep going and to create momentums and flows. And I think that's really what today's discussion is going to be about. And we're joined by actually um, the collective, two collectives, one, the Nepal Picture Library, as I mentioned, and from the Nepal Picture Library, we have Divas Raja KC and uh, Shikhar from uh, both representing the Nepal Picture Library. And we have about four or five members from the Packet Collective. Devas and Shikhar are based uh, in Dalitpur near Kathmandu, um, while the Packet Collective is spread out. It's a collective that formed in 2019, if I'm not wrong, or 2018. And um, at any given point, they, they would be a, a group of about 18 practitioners. Um, and different projects are shaped by uh, different members of that collective. Today, we're joined by Halik Aziz, Imad Majid, Sandev Handy, and um, uh, Ephraim. Uh, we will hopefully be joined by Cassie Macchiato, who is also uh, who has also been involved in uh, bringing together the heavy weight of tiny little things. So uh, everyone, if you'd like, let's switch on the cameras. Let's come together and let's start this discussion. To jump straight into it, let me actually ask the first question to Divas. I think we have a third member from the Nepal Picture Library besides Shikhar and yourself, right, Divas? There's Bunu's around, I see. Bunu's around. Bunu's, uh, Bunu's uh, this kind of imposter pretending not to be here. <laughs> All right, no problem. We can, we can have that. Um, Devas, I wanted to ask you first uh, to, uh, to, to understand a little bit better about the Nepal Picture Library. And I ask this because um, something I have noticed uh, over the years is the way uh, uh, your your group and the organization gives emphasis and importance to constantly curating or creating art projects or publications um, with the archives that you've been building. And it's really to not keep the archive static, it's to keep the archive as dynamic as possible. And which sometimes actually becomes counter counterintuitive to how people think about archives, which is that here's a space which is stable, which is static, and this is where I can go to and use it as a resource. And from it, I can curate, from it, I can write a book. Whereas you, you all at NPL are yourselves constantly keeping the archive moving. Um, what's the impetus behind it? And can you tell us what is, what is the methodology of Nepal Picture Library in, in keeping uh, such an insistence on on movement, on, on flows of information that come in where they don't stop at the archive, but are constantly being re-channeled. Sabi is always coming up with these heavyweight questions, but thank you so much, um, Sorab and Sabi for, first of all, for including us and uh, having us here and listening to us, being kind to us. You've been very generous. And we've really enjoyed watching the transformation and the iterations and how the um, you know, exhibition at uh, Surab's exhibition at um, Isara, Ishara has kind of panned out and we've been very excited to be part of this. Um, so to get to your question, I think uh, Sabi, um, I think it might be useful to begin with, um, I think recognizing that um, it, is, it is a mischaracterization to begin with, to think of archives as static. You know, and I, and I, it's a it's a it's a it's a mischaracterization that maybe has been given by historians first, 
uh, and maybe artists and others have followed suit in thinking of archives as these static um, bodies or collections of materials, uh, which, you know, it's a, it's a kind of a stereotype that historians themselves have needed uh, so that, you know, they can themselves become, so to speak, the agents, you know, they can speak of themselves as having then brought to life, you know, brought the archive to life. Uh, but if you speak to archivists themselves, you know, they would be quite offended by these, this kind of characterization, because um, I think you'll recognize quite easily if you're working with or, or around archives that uh, archives are actually quite dynamic uh, things, you know, that uh, um, the question of how one encounters an archival material, there's a lot of um, dynamic sort of agency behind it that makes makes a material available for anyone's encounter, you know, including historians or art or uh, even regular people. Um, so I think it, it's good to start with uh, to start with that. But I think, yeah, I mean, it still stands, you know, I think the, the perception that archives are static, um, you know, the, not many people have access to it. And it has to be sort of, you know, there has to we have to find ways to sort of um, make them accessible, so forth. I think for us, what guides us, honestly, um, in terms of NPL's archival work is that um, I think our um, we, we've always been serious about wanting to enact the archive in the public. So I think uh, our first commitment is to this idea of the public. And I think um, partly also, you know, you've also pointed this out because we are, we also operate as a sort of an, a collective of artists. Um, and I think this relation of an, of an artist to the public is always a contestable, difficult, tense one. So I think, um, so we also have a, you know, somewhat complex relationship with the public, but I think, um, we are quite serious about sort of um, doing our work in the public, you know, um, and I think that's the reason why a lot of our work um, takes on the curatorial sort of uh, function, um, because I mean, the first first curatorial sort of role is really to speak, you know, take the work to the public, you know, like I think the main sort of the relay and interaction for the, for the curator is with the public. And I think the first um, commitment also for a curator, even before the artist is towards the public. Um, I think uh, part of the reason why the, we, way, we work the way we work is also, I think art is a somewhat um, of a familiar, you know, modus operandi or way of being for us. And so it, you know, comes with who we are as people. Um, and we also recognize that art um, is a sort of an available infrastructure with which we can work in these very precarious times where, you know, otherwise, there's no work to be done, so to speak, uh, you know. Um, and I think the uh, last last thing I will say in response to your question is, so, you know, in, in terms of thinking about who's a curator and who's an ar archivist, because that seems to be sort of, that seems to underpin your question. Um, you know, a curator, an archivist would think is someone who works with artificial archives, so to speak, in the sense that the archivist tend to think that, you know, the natural state of the materials is what they are preserving. And there are certain forms of collections which are sort of artificially generated, like a collector's collection, which the collector goes and puts together. That uh, So it's a collection that doesn't exist in a natural state. Uh, so someone who's working with artificial collections or clusters, um, archives are curators, right? Um, so I, I'm, I, an NPL's collection in that sense is very much an artificial archive. So, you know, I think, so it makes sense that we work in this curatorial mode. Can I ask you further that when, when bringing together material, what, what's on the team's mind along with you that, okay, we're going to curate it like this. Oh, let's let's think of an art project. Oh, this is a book. So, does does that question precede uh, the act of collecting, or does that question go hand in hand with the act of collecting, or does it take place after? Because each of uh, the sequence of this sometimes ends up determining um, this methodology that you're describing. I mean, I think oftentimes it's also determined by the question of, I mean, the, by funding, you know, I mean, I think to get funding, we make a certain kind of pitch 
of a project and we have to sort of deliver on that project. But the reason why we take on the project is to build the archive, uh, you see. So I think um, there's a kind of like, um, in terms of what is determining what, you know, wh why a project or a certain collection takes the form of a book or an exhibition is some, somehow oftentimes uh, related to this question of funding as well, you know. So, um, but I think what we've been trying to do is that the, we, our interest is in building the archive and giving it longevity. Um, and we, we take on projects to make sure that that work can continue because that work by itself, you know, um, doesn't get funded, so forth. Um, but maybe uh, Shikhar and Bunu can step, step in as well because they've been very, like, you know, involved in all the projects. Um, they may also have their takes on, you know, why, why any project or collection takes the form it does. Chiku? Yeah, I just wanted to say, I mean, initially when we started the archive, um, it was not with that curatorial motive that we started the archive, you know, as photo circle here, um, as, you know, someone, uh, as a photography student, when the archive was started, it was basically a repository, repository for uh, young photographers to look at images uh, to learn from, you know, like historic images from Nepal. That was, and the reason we had to start the archive was because there was no photo archive in Nepal uh, at that time. And so, with with time, you know, with uh, initially our drive was to collect photographs. Um, it started with friends and family that we knew. We started collecting photographs, and over time, I guess we also grew as a photographer, as artist, and um, you know, our own work started to question a lot of things in the society and that also dictated how uh, we, um, you know, uh, <laughs> focus on projects and come up with projects and yeah, that's what I will say. Bunu is not in the and I think it's the team. Yeah. Oh, Sabi, we're working on a new website. So we're quite embarrassed of the old one. So we're yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is what out, what's out there. Yeah. I guess we have to live with it. Yeah. Uh, but um, uh, how big is the team at NPL at say at this moment? It's uh, seven people. Is mm -hmm. that right, Seiko? Yeah, we we have grown somewhat in this past yeah. one and a half years. Um, so, yes. All right. And All because right. we work together with like different departments in photo circle, like I and Bunu and Yitsa and things that we focus more on the archive and there's the whole other photo circle component and, you know, so yeah. it's like mm. we, we work cross ways basically. Mm. Mm. Yeah. That and also like we often have fellows join in um, mm. be, for projects. And so always ends up being a pretty big team, you know? Mm -hmm. The reason I ask is also not just because of understanding the logistics of it, but also because as much as the archive is, uh, brings together a flow of content material, it's also about bringing together con a, a flow of people um, mm -hmm. in and out. And so at this given moment, it might be like this, it's grown, it might shrink. Um, and on that note, I want to ask actually the next question to the Packet Collective. Um, and actually begin straight away with the work that they've brought in this exhibition titled The Heavy Weight of Tiny Little Things. And the question of flows is important here because, as Sohrab pointed out very early on in this discussion regarding uh, unfixing things and, um, um, and our own discussions over the past few days have been about clusters, I think uh, we're pushed to think about clusters differently right now. And why are we pushed to think about clusters differently? Because an accumulation of material has to be thought of in more imaginative ways, in more dynamic ways, because an accumulation does not necessarily mean that the accumulation is sitting still, that any accumulation moves. Every assemblage is constantly reconfiguring. And how do we bring our alertness to that movement of, of accumulations? And how do we describe them? Because usually a flow is almost treated as a counter to the accumulation. 
an accumulation is supposed to be static and a flow is supposed to be dynamic. But actually, how do we look at accumulations as dynamic entities? And the Nepal Picture Library demonstrates that um, quite beautifully and politically. Um, and so does the packet. The packet somehow for me always evokes this image of a deluge, a deluge of media archaeology in a sense. Um, and this is something that their work as modest as as uh, as its scale at the moment may seem with just this much of a mound of paper um, will in fact um, grow over the period of four months that we have. Let me just share the screen of what their work in the exhibition looks like. It's called The Heavyweight of Tiny Little Things. Every day, this printer screeches into the exhibition at regular intervals. It adds this soundscape in this picture, you see how the work looked when the Nepal Picture Library's accumulations and flows were behind it. Today in the tour, you would have noticed that all of those uh, clusters of photographs and documents have receded and we have only the red uh, thread and a timeline of uh, stories. This flow also somewhere goes into the exhibition across to the other side, almost reaching kind of like water just on the shore ebbing and uh, ebbing and flowing right so the packet i don't know who's going to answer first but um it would be nice to hear about um what went into the making of this work and the reason i'm asking that is only because i think it will automatically reveal how you deal with media content accumulation Who's going to go first? If someone's speaking, they're on mute. OK, I was waiting for Imad to jump in. Mm -hmm. Imad said they would. Imad, are you going to jump in? Yeah, OK. Um, so when um, we came together to kind of think of um, how we could respond to the work within the exhibition, there were certain themes that came up um, particularly, uh, we found that a lot of um, the artists were in some sense dealing with mortality in a way. And for me, that um, what we decided to do together as a collective was to look at our own archives. And um, these archives included uh, materials we had collected, but also some of our own works. And when I was looking at uh, my own work, some of the themes that seem to um, resonate with the um, exhibition Growing Like a Tree were dealing with the sense of many selves and um, this sort of growing and shedding and unsheathing that takes place, you know, uh, through the passage of life. And um, I started gathering these poems and particular lines from these poems that I had written over the past so many years and using those as a departure point in terms of thinking of um, um, how to make sense of um, this imagery. And um, so all of us kind of came together doing that in our own ways. And um, we found a lot of interconnections between um, what we were pulling from our archives. Um, yeah, my, my particular thread um, deals with this notion of the many selves. And I think the packet in itself is also very much this idea of this amorphous um, entity where constantly you have these shifting weights of um, voices coming through. Um, yeah, um, so to us, once we started um, approaching the archive, eventually we had to think about form and I think I'll let the others um, speak about how we arrived towards this form. Um, yeah, I feel like um, it's also, I think one of the basis of our practice is also to um, kind of have a vessel and sort of like have our conversations be drawn into that vessel and um, and then one of the reasons we also came together is to, you know, quote, quote from our bio, 
to think about what it means to what it means what it means to speak from as opposed to speaking to you know and and what it means to sometimes have a completely internal discourse without necessarily thinking about how it's projected or how it's seen from the outside and thinking about how relevant that is and uh, you know so so our main sort of like approach to this has also been thinking through ideas of community and being together and then what it means to just privilege that being together as a basis for sort of like making things um so that's why most of our sort of work revolves around conversation and what we essentially do is sort of like um immerse ourselves in a particular space or a thing we find ourselves doing and then sort of like repeatedly sort of like talk about it uh brainstorm about it and then try to kind of like pick apart the various uh threads that start coming out and i feel like maybe it was also through like the intense conversations we had with um, you guys uh, uh right sabi sarab and himanshu um about sort of like what was going on with the show and then what you were sort of like imagining and the threads and um, ideas that kind of sparked it uh, and then us going back and also having like very intense long conversations to think about how we want to sort of like be in this space you know and i feel like all of us started thinking about different things that started converging um, this idea of many selves like you are talked about um, the idea of aerial roots which you also sort of like had brought up um the idea of landscapes are very interesting to us um and i think also speaking again from uh, my um interest in in this space is also the idea of the middle east as a space for migration and a space that kind of like transforms our own histories um but i think uh what really sort of like brought us towards this particular iteration and this form was the need to kind of like stay away from the wall uh we didn't necessarily feel like we belonged on the wall space and really also thinking about um sound and then uh having some sort of like a sculptural person sort of personality in the space and uh, yeah i think it was sunday who first came up with the idea of like a print as a possibility and then we went through multiple different iterations came back to that idea uh yeah and then then yeah it, it was like a long process of thinking through on one end form and another end on on the conversations that we were having and then thinking about matching these forms into uh in, into the conversation you know um yeah so i think there's like multiple levels at work here there are the conversations itself in the piece in the paper that's getting printed out and then the fact that it's coming out of the printer in in one sort of bundle mm. and and what that kind of like means you know mm. uh yeah also has a strange parallel like is with our publishing practice so, so. Mm. thank you um imad mentioned everyone tapping into their own archives for work like this so how does that work are you all collecting your own material and is that is, is that all in your hard drives on your instagram posts or something what what is this um uh, personal archive space that imad is talking about maybe someone else from the collective might want to answer yeah maybe i can i can i can speak to that briefly um i think when it comes to personal archives i guess it's it's there's a shared personal archive and there's the personal personal archive also um so the shared personal the shared personal archive means sometimes us having tiktoks that we like and download and post um it means texts and so it's i guess i guess what you were speaking about sabi is that there you just like all of this information that kind of um lives or arrives at together by eight people or more people running an instagram account together and just posting um and seeing kind of overlaps um that emerge just by eight people posting simultaneously um and the kinds of conversations that almost these auto uh auto discourse <laughs> in some sense that that emerges um from these these sharings of archives because they come from a personal place that act of screenshotting or collecting or downloading something and then sharing again um and then how those speak to each other um i think with this piece in particular which is the the tiny weight uh, or the heavy weight of tiny little things um i'm i think i think sorha put it really quite well when he talked about that idea of unfixing um and the reason being i think we even with this sense of this dark matrix printer we all dove into our personal archives but they the archives that perhaps don't um have a particular strict form or way of um categorizing them so for example mine um takes from a set of videos um over a course of 48 hours that i had taken on a trip um with friends um i think if i'm not mistaken halik's work is a is a 
is a letter that he remembers writing to his uncle when when he was a child. Um, Imad is looking at years or you know months worth of various different writings. Um, Sharikaz is looking at you know um, a particular moment, a particular set of months um, in in their life in which they were um, yeah undergoing surgeries. Um, Cassie's is looking at more of a a research practice over time that's interested in sound, interested in the heart, interested in, in, in these ideas. So I guess all of this, um, all of these different personal archives um, in some ways get fixed temporarily because they come in through this printer. And then as they're coming out of this printer, they sort of become unfixed. Um, they become unfixed as, as a steady stream, even though they do come out as a stream, uh, but they also become unfixed within each of our sections also. Um, so in that unfixing, for example, I think, I think with, with uh, maybe I could speak a little bit about these these videos that I have um, screenshots of um, in, in this piece. Um, it's a set of 48 hours. It is me taking a trip with some sort of um, school friends that I had not met in a long time, um, did not socialize with a lot. And were, when I was very, you know, quite, quite little, um, and they come from perhaps a different community than I now am a part of or have found myself in. And so it's kind of this interesting revisiting, right? You're revisiting, you're coming back home to a kind of older version of yourself and then also seeing versions of yourself and seeing these friends of yours after a long time and kind of taking on this, you know, okay, I'm going to just video and record all of this because this is so fascinating to me, even though this is still my part of how I grew up. Um, and what happens when in that in that way of recording in the kind of um, I guess the, the the word here is uh, in the assumptions involved in, in in those recordings and why I'm choosing to record and the lens I'm adapting when I'm choosing to see um, a particular thing or record um, as I'm recording on and, and looking through this again some of those assumptions start to get more complex they start to become quite messy and and, and much more fluid than I can sort of reduce down. And I feel like in that sense, also the archive, returning to the archive for each of us um, was that process is to, to return and have, have a memory of something or have association with something. And what happens when you keep repeating that return to a set of collections, a set of screenshots, a set of videos, a set of documents, um, a letter that you might have written uh, and it's sent, it's done, it's, it's, it's completed. And then it starts to unravel every time you return to it. And so that, that unraveling, that kind of searching through and rummaging through um, these tiny things uh, and the kind of heaviness that emerges out of it really simply mm. is, is perhaps a long, long way to put answer that question. Mm. Thank you. That's, uh, Ephraim, would you like to say something or would, would you want to add in as we continue in the conversation? Um, I don't mind uh, picking in. Uh, in terms of my personal archive, um, I was, so when we, when uh, y'all had reached out to the packer, I think we were just coming out of our third lockdown. Um, and I had gone back to my parents' house just to, for a quick visit. Similar to what uh, Sunday was saying, I, I quite dislike going back to my parents' house. So it's very boring. Um, and um, yeah, as, as a way to sort of distract myself, I uh, found my old medical records. But unfortunately, it wasn't like the massive dome that I remembered uh, with like multiple scans, x-rays, all sorts of fascinating uh, mapping of my face, basically. Um, and this was, this was the immediate encounter that I had while, while this conversation invitation was like being discussed. Um, and I thought that it, it, it would speak for itself while I'm rummaging through uh, some of the uh, incidents that are happening in this period. And I was hoping that it would speak to the uh, exhibition by default. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to, to some to, to more people now, just completing a full circle to begin with. So let me first ask my colleague here at Ishara, Himanshu, who recently joined um, a few months ago and uh, deep drive, deep dive straight into the deep end with uh, the second iteration. Um, Himanshu comes from a practice of archaeology that then 
shifted towards curating and collaborating closely with artists um, and creating a dynamic and relational kind of uh, uh, position between contemporary artworks and colonial artifacts in the museum he worked with uh, previously called the Bhaudachi Lad Museum in Mumbai. Uh, a lot of the conversations that went into the making of this show uh, were, were informed by actually some of the uh, some of the ideas that Himanshu would bring in, while Sorab and I would talk about flows and clusters, Himanshu would talk about striations and ruptures. So I wanted, from coming from archaeology, so I wanted to ask Himanshu a little bit about his reading of this process and the exhibition, perhaps, and how he looks at flows in archaeology and curating, well, both. I don't want to fix you in archaeology either. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't want to get fix, like fixated to archaeology, so I'm going to slightly take a different uh, position here. Mm -hmm. And um, what I what I want to go back to is uh, my last question to Sora. Uh, I think that was something related to, uh, which is like the exhibition as a living and breathing organism, uh, you know, which is expanding, evaporating, shrinking, moving, extracting, swinging, flux. So it's like so many different elements that have, you know, that have gone into in making of, I, I, I in fact, I'm quite reluctant to call like the iteration as well, because I think the exhibition, there are two iterations in here, because like, you know, uh, it's like when you, uh, okay, I, I think my archaeologist is coming back. So it's like when you're looking at into a stratigraphic uh, landscape that you find, uh, you know, things that are deposited at different levels, which has kind of, uh, just a position that happens within within themselves. So you know, um, I think also that another point which uh, which keep which keep kind of reoccurring in my brain is that the Saurabh's map, which is the uh, if I'm not mistaken, incomplete map of interconnectedness, um, uh, because those those forms that emerges, the act of like uh, not just like mapping and archiving, but it's like the extrapolation. Uh, from the uneven terrains that exist within the exhibition, and I felt like more of like uh, this. Uh, this was like uh, for me. This was like looking like more of a stratigraphic form, but and which is like the layers and layers of deposit formation that kind of leads to create creation of new ecosystems. And as we are talking about the valves here, uh, I want to kind of elaborate slightly about like uh, my reading towards what is happening now with the Nepal Bridge Library. Uh, where you have this beautiful uh, red line that remain uh, with the stories of uh, these amazing two women, Sushila, Shreshtan, and uh, Shantamanvi. Uh, what, really, what really kind of intrigued my, my mind was thinking about what if we actually start at the end of the archive, like the end of the story, which it starts something with uh, uh, I choose not to run. That is the beginning of the last uh, uh, the last story that that kind of stays within uh, the line itself, and I think I found that some completely fascinating because it is it is the uh, it is the choice of not to run within the election uh, on that format of uh, what the struggles of both of these ladies have gone through. So I think for me that was like an interesting point to go back to, like. Uh, Let's like kind of jump towards the end and then come backwards and see what happens with that. I think that was something which I really enjoyed uh, or like provoked uh, my mind when I think about that work. And with the packet, uh, I felt like uh, the title and like the heavy weight of tangible things, which producing like the collage of text images, opposing certain critical questions, like media archaeology using different uh, methodologies to evolve a certain form again, but what intrigued me is their choice of the dot matrix printer, uh, because it's also the printing technique. It's just not about the printer itself, but the print the, uh, the printing technique, if I'm not mistaken, is the is the bi-directional printing. Uh, within that, the interesting form is that uh, the way it prints is that you know the line from the left to the right, and then from right to the left, rather than returning to the left to begin the next line. So uh, that that form I felt was quite an interesting way to produce an image and the text, uh, and I also felt like this was like more of like the blood flowing through our veins, uh, you know, also collapsing of 
uh, scripts while you are introducing uh, different languages, for example, English or Hindi and Marathi kind of written from the right to the left, where the Urdu version is written from the left to the right. Mm. So these kind of, uh, these kind of, uh, as Saurabh keep reiterating about the co-locations that happens within the artworks, I think, uh, you know, it's like even, even the sound kind of mixing, uh, the printer, the dot metric printer sound is mixing with the sound uh, uh, of Ritu's uh, Harano Sur. So it's like uh, the kind of sonic uh, 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 interpolation that happens within the exhibition uh, is some, you know, it has like many different layers and being like simply this iteration. So that's why, you know, I'm kind of a bit reluctant to call them uh, like it, uh, iterations as such. So I think, yeah. Beautiful, uh, uh, Manchu. So many references blood flows, striations, and just whatnot, uh, writing left to right, writing right to left, starting the story at the end. Thank you very much. Um, if, if Saurabh doesn't, Saurabh, would you like to add something to our discussion on flows and valves? Otherwise, I have another question for everyone, yeah, I mean, including yourself. Uh, mm. For me, it's, I don't know whether it's a question or an observation, but it's going to be maybe a little, you know, circular and may not make sense, but um, I mean, firstly, there is an element of weight on both sides, you know, diagonally opposite. I mean, the he heavy weight of tiny little things and Zenab's work is the weight of snow on a chest, where in her writing, she alludes to the fact that it's a heavy weight. So there is some sort of allusion to a heaviness. Um, so for me, it's really um, interesting that uh, even people who are in a way showing work in, in an exhibition that's primarily to do with something visual, somehow um, the reference to weight, which is felt and not really seen is what, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, is I think, um, in a way, anchoring those works, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the other one is, um, when I was uh, listening to both uh, Nepal Pach Library and the packet, it made me think about agility within an archive and lightness, even though, you know, it's the heaviness of uh, tiny little things. But I feel like um, there's a certain notion of heavy, uh, lightness and agility that I feel, again, from the outside, that um, feels like a big part of the work process. And uh, a few years ago, I'd asked an art, an art historian, you know, uh, this one question, and he was quite pissed off about it, I think, because I was projecting my existential crisis to do with the archive, where I was trying to tell him in a QA and a after his talk that as an art historian, you like, we, we are at a time when uh, time is collecting faster and faster and within it, you know, with it, the archive is growing faster and faster, right? So as an art historian, you have all the material because in a way you seem to be looking back and, and looking at what has been collected in the repository. Whereas in my way of working, even if I'm looking at the archive, it's all in front in some ways, even though I connect it to what's been collected, you know, because in a way I feel like when I look at, for example, um, NPL, a lot of the things that they're doing, even if they're looking into the past, they are in a way connecting it to, you know, the present and in a way also, they, they're very much in touch with the pulse of um, whether it's the political situation back home, whether it's, uh, you know, the cultural vibe, whether it is, you know, how people, like how people are existing right now. So in a way, I'm seeing them draw out or pull out threads from the archive constantly, right? Uh, so there is this connection to the past and the present and um, the packet is the same. They're pretty much, you know, you can see they are the valve, you know, the, the work is the valve and we are seeing it in a way uh, going through time. Um, so for me, I think it was just a projection onto you all now and not the art historian, but how do you all deal with it? Because I feel that uh, I'm constantly struggling with, uh the archive building faster than i can actually make sense of it you know and i'm talking about a much larger archive and not just um you know uh what one might have as scans but i'm imagining that in some ways how for example sabi is quickly googling you know 
images and that is in itself the archive that is collecting and sabi is constantly extracting it live you know as uh, this conversation is happening so so just a existential projection onto you all devas do you want to go first i can i add to sorab's question because it's quite related one is how you're dealing with this but uh, the second is do we even need the the concept of the archive anymore so to to all of you i mean so starting yeah. with devas and everyone so so, so I, I, hmm. and so I, let me yeah sorry no gone sort of no just to add to your thing hmm. because i forgot about that because also when i was looking at uh, npl and packet and thinking about the agility uh, it also made me then go back to the preciousness that one associates with the archive you know uh, when one thinks of the static archive in that sense the valuable archive mm. uh, like silver prints archival prints you know uh, vintage prints if it's a photography archive for example um, but then i think about the inherent nature of image making being like re reproduction of the image being an inherent part of it and i'm seeing both npl and packet also using that method of reproduction within the archive so just inserting that as well yeah yeah uh, so there's this media theorist uh, wolfgang ernst who says that um as much as archives have become such an important like uh, sometimes a uh, construct and sometimes a metaphor in the way accumulations are described now actually to collect everything is very anti archival is not actually archival so uh, and he goes into a more elaborate this thing so but what what i want to ask is yeah do we even to eat, to starting with divas the concept i'm not saying we we should do away with the with the institutions that have been collecting but why do we even do we even need the 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 archive or do we need another tool now if the archive was one tool do we need another tool and that tool might be the valve it might be something else um so what in your how would you respond to us yeah i mean complicated questions uh, especially thinking about your question in relation to sorab's question let me quickly get to sorab's question first uh, in terms of you know what came to my mind as sorab was speaking and also like trying to uh, situate ourselves um, the work that we do at npl in the kind of um, this question of you know past its usefulness in the present and how to imagine futures what does past have to do with um, all of that those set of questions and i think um, i think uh, the reason why sorab you i feel like you are kinder to us or you you see us as doing a different kind of archival practices i think it it, it is related to um you know what i tried to say earlier about sort of working in the public which is something that uh, like art historians or academics we somehow like you know they have a permission to not be answerable to publics in a way that artists also have that uh, kind of uh, um what's the word allowance right that uh, those aren't people who should necessarily be answerable to publics which is the reason why they get to do the kind of work they do you know uh, and 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 there is this issue that you know the uh, the question of producing knowledge probably needs to be happening away from public opinion and so forth right um and i think our practice is slightly different than that so i, I think that is related to why you find uh, our engagement with history and the archive uh, more sort of relatable or commendable so forth um and i think um and that might be related to sabhi's question about um why archives right and i think um it's it is i think important to keep in mind that art archives you know things have history and archives also do have history right i mean i think the archives haven't always existed in the way um it does now or it did 50 years ago or it wasn't used in the same ways in you know across time uh and so which tells us that archives is a sort of a form uh, that hasn't always been institutional uh and it does change with uh with time you know different sort of time period probably requires different probably gives different form to the archive um i think the more important question to ask sabi in relation to this is um 
whether an archive is needed or not is a bit irrelevant in some ways, given given the sort of that, you know, the history changes and archives changes. I think the more important question is, do we need memory, you know, and how do we, you know, how does society work with the memory that it needs? And how does it organize memory? Um, and is that, and given that memory will always have uh, collective forms, um, it plays out heavily in politics, um, so forth. Uh, I think it, at the end, it really becomes about how are we organizing forms of mnemonics uh, and memory keeping, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, NPL, I mean, we're not the only example, hundreds of archives that have sort of started in the last 20 years, in that sense, are already not archives. You know, we are archives that are non-archives. We do not work in the way that um, archival principles say archives should work, right? Uh, I think we're already part of, of, we already forms of archives that exist in, you know, the one thing that you guys have been pointing out, which is sort of, uh, this uh, relevance of networked, you know, network societies and being in networks and flows all the time. Um, I think the the question is how is archive how how are archives going to function in this form of society? Um, and I think uh, we are an example among hundreds and thousands of new archives uh, that are sort of trying to navigate this new form, you know, a, a, a new form of an archive uh, for a society that we have recognized has changed in the last fifty years. You know, um, um, yeah. I mean, that's mm. what I have to say. Thank you, thank you, Packet or anyone else from NPR. Um, I guess to quickly jump in with some thoughts that uh, your question sparked. Um, the backup, I feel, sort of exists very much. I don't know if the valve is the correct space to talk about uh, our space, but it, it's a space of processing, I feel, not necessarily thinking too much about what exists in the archive or even if an archive exists. I think most of the time what happens is there's a question and then there's a need to respond and then an archive arises in response to that. Um, and I feel maybe that's also got to do a lot with sort of like the media environment in which we work in, in which a lot of the archives are kind of already, always already there in a sense, you know, and I feel like maybe uh, our Instagram is a good example um, to, to kind of illustrate this point. Um, it's always been a very playful kind of like a approach uh, in, in regards to all of our work in general, but our Instagram kind of I feel illustrates that with about eight uh, people um, operating the account simultaneously and then generally sort of like posting a, a mix of sort of like photographs and videos that they've taken themselves, things borrowed from the internet, and then you sort of like start seeing these conversations um, sort of arising in our stories. And often these are very unplanned, really random sort of like spontaneous kind of like outbursts from different people in the space. But there is kind of like a generative kind of like a space that's being built in the stories that start narrativizing these random content. You know, And I feel like maybe that's one way that I see like maybe NPL and, and also the, 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 um, the Arab uh, photo image foundation, uh, image foundation kind of Arab, working. Arab image foundation. Yeah, where Akram Zatari, for example, borrows and plunders, essentially plunders archives and then makes it and matches in a certain way to kind of like re kind of like tell stories, right? So um, I feel like we kind of exist a little bit more unconsciously in that space where we are kind of like plundering. Uh, memory plundering kind of like existing archives and then creating kind of like new archives but also with not with a sort of like an intention to preserve them as such you know and I feel maybe I'm reflecting a little bit also on the um the writing that Sarabi shared about um yesterday that you never published um and thinking about how we are living sort of like in a sea of imagery right we've been so saturated by images it almost feel like feels like taking photographs and contributing to that flow of image is almost redundant. You know, it feels almost like that it is not very, it's not productive anymore. So I think it also comes from a saturation within images and a need to kind of like deal with that flow and maybe adopting methods of peripheral seeing, you know, apophonic seeing, pattern recognition and trying to sort of like, yeah, use that skill of, or use that uh, proclivity to recognize patterns to sort of like, put it through and maybe a valve is a good way of kind of like talking about that um, space. Mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know if that was. Thank you. Thank you, Habik. Before someone else comes in on this, uh, if anyone from the audience um, attending wants to ask a question, please write them in chat um, and we'll relay them here. Anyone else? Ephraim, Sandev, Imad. 
I think, yeah, I just, I just did want to jump in a little bit into, I think, um, yeah, the question of, yeah, is the archive important? But then uh, something that Sarhab said, um, which is sometimes the, the archive is growing faster than you can keep up with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think for me, um, the archive in a sense is, is, is automatic or, or just happens or it's already existing uh, because the present is growing faster than I can keep up with it or then we can keep up with it. Time is growing faster than we can keep up with it. Um, I've been reading, uh, I think, uh, Riel uh, Azule talks about the sense of imperial time, where we're constantly moving forward, right? We're asked to move forward, move on, move next. Um, and I think in, in this sense, that sense of like the archive or the collection is sort of automatic. I mean, it's, it's just, it's my screenshots, all right? Um, and that's happening because it's a means of trying, my archive is trying to keep up with the present um, in some sense. Um, and, and, and revisiting the archive that kind of going back um is just a way for me to keep up with the now uh, and not to kind of be moving on to be to be siding along and i think it's just that idea of maybe that we have the right to go back uh, and the present is moving so fast and, and images images are so loud and so prolific that um we, we we can't even stay in the in in the present or make sense of the now or think um think about what is happening i think in i think in terms of what you were saying with the nepal picture library also right what does it mean to speak to a particular moment um and i think in that sense it's almost the archive is 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 just a place that that is collecting a, a, a present that you're going back to to make sense of to revisit um and i think with the packets work something that you know you know in this in this kind of right to go back in this kind of trying to make sense of the present uh, by looking at this kind of auto archive of sorts uh, either personally or collectively um is to even think about uh, maybe the idea of a village idiot right to think in public to say i am we are going to speak in public and talk in public and 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 look at some of these images that uh, a former present was collected from a former present was collected from a former proliferation of imagery and sound and noise um, and then piece that together um, and to think about it publicly um, and sometimes thinking about it publicly can be quite embarrassing uh, but it can also I think yield some really interesting hyper hyper contextual or hyper local or way things that only make sense to a certain geography of people however we think about geography I think these are just some of the things that um, I think the question of the archive or the archive capital A is, is not really something that uh, at least interests me when it comes to this. It is just kind of an automated set of actions. Um, it's a coping uh, more than an archive, it was archiving uh, of sorts. Thank you. Imad, Sharika. Um, yeah. I... No, you go ahead. <laughs> Um, yeah, as much as I find the archive like impeded and pushing us constantly forward and the archive rapidly accumulating, uh, thinking about the archive that I went back to, um, it was it's slowly deteriorating. Uh, so, so I guess in some ways when certain kinds of archives are rapidly um, accelerating, others are being forgotten and uh, being destroyed as well. Um, and, and both of these are occurring at the same time, you know? Um, and I guess, um, in, a, in a way, I'm also glad that this uh, forgetting and destruction happened in the archive that I went to, because if I were to solely rely on the doctor's notes, I think, to go back to uh, uh, Sorab's idea of the fixity, I think the sort of medical gaze into, into uh, what was going on in my case would have rooted it in, in the in the medical industrial complex itself. But because I didn't have all all those records that I remembered, um, I had to fill in the gaps with like some of my feelings, some of the things that I carried away, some of the feelings before the surgeries. And in that sense, I guess the the forgetting helped, uh, the forgetting and the destruction of the archive also helped to unfix um, itself. Mm. Mm. Yeah, and in response to that, I was also um, going to speak about this need to forget, actually, because to me, what the uh, valve evokes is um, it controls pressure, right? The accumulation, the constant sort of, um, as things also uh, towards what Sandev was speaking to, 
um, we're constantly making decisions as to every impulse to screenshot something is an impulse to record, to keep. And um, I think there's also these unconscious decisions often of what we forget. And I think in my process of revisiting these poems, um, a lot of it is this idea of what can be forgotten, what aspects of our um, former selves um, are forgotten and when are those decisions really ever made? Because we're constantly adjusting these valves as we grow, as we unsheathe. Um, and I think without these valves, you just like would, um, the pipes burst, you know? Mm. Um, and I think in that sense, yeah, the valves are important to me. It's um, these um, unconscious or subconscious ways in which we adjust what we remember and what we forget um, as we um, keep existing. Mm, thank you. Actually, you know, this, this reminds me of one of my favorite um, uh, contemporary philosophers, Paul Preciado, and their work on uh, biopolitics, contemporary biopolitics, where um, there's a suggestion of, or actually there's an insistence on untethering the archive from memory. This whole binary of, between memory and forgetting, and it's, it's, it's being located, hyperlocated into archives, has to be untethered. So that it's not a question of memory and uh, memory. The archive is not a question of memory or what's forgotten, but rather taking it into a kind of uh, a biomorphism of, of some kind of uh, digestion. Is our digestion, is our digestive system remembering or forgetting? We don't use those, those processes in our digestive system. And this is not digestion just as simply uh, uh, like a nice healthy digestion. It's also about shitting. It's also about um, gas formation. It's also about indigestion. It's also about absorption of nutrients or hormones based on um, um, uh, porosities of our skin, not just uh, what is consumed. And therefore, to uh, that that's somewhere where my question was coming from also with regard to the archive is, um, it's almost a dismissal of the archive itself. If we need to think about memory, let's think about something else and some other form. And if we need to think about archive, let's not think about memory necessarily, but let's think about maybe digestion and pro processing of something through. And digestion in that sense then suggests a very different form of flows. It's, it's, a flowing, it's a flowing absorption, extraction of very different nature. And obviously, again, it's not some naturalistic, anthropomorphic kind of uh, thing that Preziado is coming from either. It's, it's about chemical absorption. It's about chemical um, uh, reactions also and those kind of things. So, but then we have now five minutes left. If Amanchu and Saurabh want to add in something I mean, to me, the valve was opening these kinds of uh, directions in, and, and where maybe by the end, why are we discussing archives is the question. But that's my, my thing. Uh, why, why aren't we just discussing valves and flows and, and, and what forms do flows take? Imad brought this beautiful, this thing of, of uh, valves and, and controlling pressure. So why aren't we discussing pressure cookers actually, uh, or something like that? I don't know. So, uh, but uh, let me not take up more time. And uh, Himanshu, Sohrab, do you want to come in? We have five minutes, so we'll have to keep it brief. Yeah, I'll just be very brief about it. Like I've been thinking about uh, uh, like what Imad said about the valves, like, you know, uh, I'm, I'm uh, kind of curious about the apparatus of the archive, like not just, okay, even if we not think about the archive, but the, uh, the whole apparatus of the image making and the images that are kind of constant in flux. Uh, I'm thinking about the Arab Spring and uh, the relation of the image that was circulating around at, at the time period uh, when it was getting spread or, or the Black Lives Matter or example, the current, the farmers protests in, 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 uh, right outside the Delhi challenging the whole apparatus of a government in a sense. So, you know, there are these, uh, as I said, the valves can actually create an interesting uh, rupture within, within, the, uh, within the archive itself. Mm. Mm. Thank you. 
I, I'll pick up from, you know, what Halik mentioned about pattern recognition and what Imad mentioned about the pipelines bursting, because I think that, um, uh, I think when I started uh, making images, I feel that uh, there were these, sep you know, the archive was very separate. I think that uh, my own practice, and I think, you know, what we were making may have been more part of the dominant image culture in that sense. And then there was the colloquial, right? Because there were these sort of separations. And today when I look at it, um, and I think it's also affected the way I'm working quite a bit, is that I, I feel like what was the colloquial has today become the mainstream, you know, like the packet has been constantly talking about making screenshots, Instagram accounts, people who are actually affecting image culture are not photographers, filmmakers, they're actually people who are uh, working with images in a far more free way. And um, I do see the accumulation now kind of hurtling down um, in a way that Imad was talking about the bursting of those pipes. And all I feel I can do, and I feel I'm also part of that hurtling down. It's not as if it's separate anymore. In fact, in some ways, I'm talking about the image archive simply because of the context of uh, you know, the exhibition and so on. But to be honest, I think that it is just the archive of everything, which is hurtling down and everything is getting sucked into it in some ways. But what it's actually doing is it's throwing out patterns for me. So the more I kind of recognize the archive being more as a flow, what I'm actually recognizing are patterns like, um, and, and what also allows me to do is to disrupt those patterns or, or to kind of extract them. And that's where I feel like, you know, I, I, I kind of uh, can in a way choose the valve that I kind of bring in to pull something out. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. But on that note, we have run out of time. So any concluding remarks from you, Sarah? Let's, let's bring you in. This is, this is the very last no, uh, tour of our six transformation. And uh, yeah, I hope that um, it's, it's just about the momentum. And I hope that we, we don't quite know what it's going to lead to right now. Thank you. Yes. Uh, from my side, from all of us at Ishara, thank you very much. Um, this is obviously uh, only one set of programs around this exhibition, and we're hoping that we'll be able to do other kinds of dialogues, um, if not on Zoom, then through some other form that uh, our website and our physical space can, can, can be hospitable to. So on that note, um, thank you everyone who's attended. Thank you everyone who's, who's joined us. Thank you everyone really for your generosity and making this possible despite all the distances. And I must say that I, this conversation today could have easily gone on for a few more hours um, and something very interesting would have come out of it, not that it hasn't already. So thank you. And I hope at least wherever we are and with whichever groups we are uh, with, uh, this might also seep into some of that. Uh, thank you again, and we'll be in touch. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you.